So we talked about row operations not changing your row space. And what that means is your row space, you could perform some operations, transform your matrix into something a little bit nicer, and then look at the row space of the nicer matrix. So sometimes that could be helpful. So you can always perform row operations and your row space won't change. So we have another theorem. So if A is an M by N matrix, let capital N equal the set of solutions to the homogeneous linear system. x equals 0, then I'll write the uh, conclusion on the next line. So that was all the hypothesis. So if A is M by N matrix and capital N's the set of solutions to the homogeneous linear system, then N is a subspace. It might be Rm or it might be Rn. We're going to look at the dimension and figure out. So I'm, we're going to, don't write down M or N. We'll decide which of the two it's going to be. So it's going to be one of those two dimensions. So we'll fill that in in a minute. And the subspace. <coughs> N is also called the null space of the matrix A. And of course, we want to write things out in the laziest way possible, i.e. the most efficient way possible. So we'll use the function null. Don't ask me why that's abbreviated with four letters and all the other three, two were abbreviated with three letters. If you really want, you can just do NUL, null space, but I'm gonna use NULL. So that's null space of A. So let's look at the proof. So really all the claim here is that this set S is a subspace. That's really the claim right here. It's a subspace. So let's go with, uh, let's prove zero is in there. So why is zero in N? So let's look and see what N is. N is the solution to AX equals zero. So what is A, any matrix A times a zero vector? Zero. We'll get zero out. So zero is one obvious trivial solution to that homogeneous system. So you all get zero for sure. Now we're going to check. So that was the first part. So we got zero is in there. So because it is a solution, that's how this set was defined. Uh, part two, we'll check any vectors u and v inside n. We're supposed to show u plus v is inside n. All right, so what does it mean to be in n? There's only one defining property to being a member of the set N, and that is your solution to a, AX equals zero. So this means AU equals zero and AV equals, and when I say zero, I mean the zero vector. I don't think I made that clear up above. This is the zero vector over here, and this X is also the vector X. <coughs> So 
So we know that the matrix A times U is a zero vector and the matrix A times V is a zero vector. Now we're going to check what is A times U plus V. So what is A times U plus V? What algebraic property can I use? Eventually this better equal zero or we're in trouble. If it equals zero, that means we're in still inside the set N. So we're trying to show this is the zero vector. What algebraic property can I use here? A Distributive property. Now individually, our assumption when they both of these vectors came from N that A times U was zero and A times B was zero. So individually these are both zero. So we got zero vector plus the zero vector and add the zero vector to itself, get the zero vector out. So that means addition, is, this is closed under addition. And last up, we're gonna check scalar multiplication. So any vector V in N and any scalar, we're supposed to show alpha V is in the set N. So if this vector V is in N, that means AV is the zero vector. And now let's look at what is A times alpha V. I'm going to first reassociate A alpha V. Why am I allowed to commute alpha and A? You can always reassociate, no matter what type of objects you're multiplying. If you don't have associativity, you're working in a really weird system. So you're pretty much always going to have associativity. What lets me commute? You can't commute matrices. Yeah. So alpha is a scalar. You can commute scalars as much as you want. So scalars can be commuted. That's what lets us switch the order. If alpha was not a scalar, if alpha's a matrix, there's no way I could switch this order. But because alpha's a scalar, they commute. And then we can reassociate. And we got alpha times the zero vector now. And any number times the zero vector is zero vector. So there we go. We showed that alpha v is a solution to that homogeneous system there. So our set will be closed under addition and scalar multiplication, and that's all it takes to show we have a subset. Or show that we have a subspace. Thus, n is a subspace. Now we're going to check the dimensions. So. It's either going to be m, uh, m dimensional or n dimensional. Let's carefully look at the dimensions of A. So m rows by n columns. So if we think of Ax, so A is m by n. What dimensions does the vector x have to have if I'm going to multiply? N by something. It's got to be n by something so that we get the inside uh, dimensions to match. Now, x is a vector, so it's n by what? It's a vector. We're treating it like a matrix when we multiply. So x has n rows. How many columns? Every vector has how many columns? One. One. So it's a vector, so it's just a column vector. So it's got n rows, single column. And if I want to write this out more graphically, you have m rows. So our vertical measurements, m, horizontal measurements, n. And on our vector, 
our horizontal measure is 1 and the vertical measure is n. And then the two that match are those two right there. So that's writing them out as in more uh, laid out <coughs> the way it would look if we actually filled in coordinate in, in entries inside our matrix and our vector. So that's really what's going on. And then of course on the right side we got zero, but now we can write down what what dimensions does a zero vector have? M by one. It's a little tricky, but it's m by one. It's got the outer dimensions that we multiplied with. So it's m by 1. So our 0 vector down here definitely has a width of 1. But it's a little bit strange. Our height is now m. <coughs> so let's look at n. So x is in n when ax equals 0. So what dimensions does x have? Same as n by 1. So x is an n by 1 matrix, <coughs> which is the same thing as saying x is in Rn. So it's n dimensional space. There's n entries inside your, inside your vector x. n is a subspace of Rn. So now we can put the dimension of our space is n-dimensional space. Now it's a little bit weird because our zero vector is actually m-dimensional, not n-dimensional. So technically the zero is zero in Rm. So it's a little bit weird but just from the way we multiply, that's so why I went through all the dimensions super carefully. And you can always think of things in terms of matrix products. So as long as you remember your inside uh, dimensions match, your outside dimensions are your product dimensions. So we'll go up and then write the correct somewhere up here. Here we go. So n is a subspace of R and <coughs> So I think this is a good amount of notes for this section. Let me check how much. Yeah, that's probably good. We'll move into the next section. And we'll get into basis. Start with the definition. So a basis for a vector space is a set B such that so there are two properties span of B equals S so what that means every element every vector in your space is a linear combination of things in B the other property you need so this Oops, what happened to two? One, two. So part one says there's enough vectors in B that basically cover your subspace. Now that's not the best word to use. The best word is you can use a linear combination to get to any point or any vector. Uh, the other part, part two, is there's not extra elements in B, meaning 
if there's anything in B, any vectors in B, you can create from other linear combination of other vectors, you need to throw them out. So that is the set B is linearly independent. That's a basis right there. So a basis B for a vector space S is a minimal spanning set. So it has to span the entire space and can't have extra vectors in there. So it's the minimal number of vectors you need to span and is heavily related to the dimension. So if you know the dimension of your vector space, let's say your dimension is three, you will need exactly three vectors in your basis. Every basis for that space will have three vectors in it. There are nice bases and there are not nice bases. So let's look in R4. <clears throat> so we're going to find a basis for R4. How many vectors do you think we will need? Probably four. So let's think of an easy set of four vectors that are linearly independent and I could make any vector in four dimensional space with the linear combination of these four vectors. So I'm going to pick the easiest ones I could think of. Here's the worst vector for any basis. Why is that a horrible vector? Because that's not a what can I make with linear combinations of this vector? Well, Don't say nothing. I can make itself. So I can add up as many of these as I want, multiply by any number, and I have this vector. So this is a useless vector in your vector in your basis. So never put this vector in your basis because it gets you nothing. Any other vector, any other non-zero vector multiplied by the scalar zero gives you this vector. So you don't need the zero vector in your basis ever. This vector, however, is pretty nice. One zero 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 zero. So think of this as your first coordinate vector right here. The next nice vector will be the y vector that has one in the y coordinate and zero in the other coordinates. And it's not hard to see the last two vectors in this form. This is what we call the standard basis right here. This is the easiest basis to make for R4. You just put one, basically you take one coordinate at a time and just have the unit vector in that coordinate. So from this, if I asked you for the standard basis for R5, you should be able to follow the pattern and write out the standard basis for R5. You just add another coordinate on each vector, which will be a zero at the bottom, and then you'll need a fifth vector that'll put the one in the last coordinate. And so you can go to any dimension you want, and in Rn, there'll be n vectors, and you just put a one in different coordinates. So that will be the standard basis for Rn. Let's prove this is both linearly independent and prove that any vector you're thinking of in R4, you can make a linear combination from this. You should be easy to do because these vectors have a lot of zeros in them. All right, so we're going to prove this. So I think first up, we'll go in order. We'll write the span. So the span of all of these all 
All right, how do we prove this? All we need to do is take any vector, an arbitrary vector in R4, any vector V in R4. Now, if it's any vector, all I know is it has four different co has four coordinates. So we'll just let V equal alpha 1, alpha 2, alpha 3, alpha 4. So I just put four numbers in there. They could be any values whatsoever. So we need to get four scalars that I can write a linear combination here. All right, what four scalars give me this equality here? So I picked these very carefully so that we can very obviously see what scalars go here. So how, what's the only way I can get alpha 1 in the first coordinate here? First vector times alpha 1. So we've got an alpha 1 there. That'll put alpha 1 in the first coordinate, and it won't change any of the other coordinates. So now the second vector, the way we get alpha 2 in the second coordinate, is our second vector is multiplied by alpha 2. And again, that only affects coordinate 2. Then for coordinate 3, we would just multiply alpha 3 by the third vector. And then the fourth coordinate, we get that by alpha 4 times the fourth vector. So this is a very, very easy linear combination. Doesn't take much thought to see this one work out. So any questions on this right here? So whatever four numbers you're thinking of, those entries turn out to be the four, no, the four coefficients to make that one up. Now we have to show linear independence. So that was part one, part two. There's a few ways to do this. It's tempting to just say, hey, look at those vectors. They're obviously linear, linearly independent. But we should show why. So we're going to suppose that alpha 1, 1, 0, 0, 0, plus alpha 2, 0, 1, 0, 0, plus alpha 3, 0, 0, 1, 0 plus alpha 4, 0, 0, 0, 1 equals, what should this equal for linear independence? Zero. Zero. So linear independence is what, uh, what linear combination gives you zero? You're independent if there's only one combination that gives you zero, which is the trivial combination right here. So we're setting it intentionally to zero, and we're setting up a homogeneous system. This should have exactly one solution. I could put this into a matrix. So if we look at our matrix, what can we say about the solution? So it's a trivial solution. So alpha 1 is 0, alpha 2 is 0, alpha 3 is 0, alpha 4 is 0. So all the alphas equal 0 is the only solution. At this point in the class, you may not even need to write this matrix out. I just put into a box, depending on how comfortable you are thinking about uh, row reduction and matrices versus linear combinations. So at some point you'll realize that everything is basically the same, but until that happens, it can be useful to write out your matrix and just realize that we got no free variables, they're all locked down, and they all have to equal zero.
So let's do a non-trivial problem now. <coughs> Vectors will be 3, negative 1, 5, 2, 1, 3, and 0, negative 5, 1. What? So <clears throat> this is going to be a, spans are always subspaces. This span is a subspace of what vector space? Three. So this will be a subspace of R3. So it's already a subspace of R3. We'll call this span S so we don't have to keep rewriting it. So S is a subspace so just with that information what's the maximum number of elements in the basis? Three. So maximum of three however it's possible that this span is not all of our three. So it's possible this span could be two dimensions, could be one dimension. Looking at it, there's no way it could be zero dimensional. It's probably somewhat clear it's, uh, there's no way it's gonna be zero dimensional because there's a non-zero vector in here. It's not one dimensional because I can already tell that these two matrices are not multiples of each other. So it's at least two dimensional. However, it may not be three dimensional because it's possible that these vectors are not independent. So if these vectors are independent already, well, it's already spanning itself. If it's also independent, we're done. That's all it takes to be a uh, basis. It spans your space and is independent. So all we have to do is check is it independent or is it not. So I'll write that down. So a span is automatically a subspace. So we proved that one or two classes ago. So we proved spans are subspaces. So that was part one is done. Now part two, we have to see is it independent? So do that right now. Check, are these independent? Are they dependent? And not only check independent or dependent, but find the vector that is a linear combination of the others if it's dependent. So you gotta pick which vector you wanna throw out. So you're not just checking for independence, you're also going to decide what vector do we remove so that we have independence. And if you're having trouble setting it up, raise your hand. Or other questions? I'll have your midterm any time that we can take a quiz in here. I just want to check the folder. Oh, okay. Are you guys bring it on the case that we can do quizzes? Yeah. So just remind me.
don't know why I'm using such huge numbers. <laughs> Not fun. Any row operation questions? Are there any different values? So we got alpha one plus alpha three equals zero. Alpha two minus three alpha three equals zero. So what can we say? We have a free variable here. So do we have independence or not? No. Nope. So we got way more than the trivial solution. So we do not have a basis. So what we need to do is decide one of the, we have one free variable. So all we have to do is remove one vector. <coughs> Let's go ahead and write, we'll solve uh, alpha three is free. <coughs> uh, so alpha one is equal to negative two alpha three. Alpha two equals three alpha three. And of course alpha three equals alpha three. So I'll fill in the values. So plug them back in to the equation at the top. So I got minus two alpha three times our three negative one five vector plus three alpha three times two one three plus alpha three times the vector zero negative five one equals the vector zero zero zero. What algebra can I do to make this equation a little more simple? Factor out alpha three. Oh, there's, so I'll factor out alpha three. We got negative two, three, negative one, five. The other thing I could have done, I could have picked an alpha three value that wasn't zero, and I could have plugged that in. And the easiest value is pick it to be one. So I could have picked alpha three to be one, <coughs> but we're about to divide by alpha three, so it won't matter here. So as long as alpha three is not zero, I can divide by it or multiply by the reciprocal. So here is how these three vectors are related. Now all I'm gonna do is solve for the easiest vector, which is probably the last vector here because it's got no coefficient. So I'm just going to subtract the other two to the right side. In this last form, what you can see is the third vector is a linear combination of the first two. So that means the third vector is not necessary. So the vector zero, negative five, one is, is a linear combo.
of the other two, which are three, negative one, five, and two, one, three, which means zero, negative five, one is an element of the span of just the other two. So any questions about the logic of that conclusion there? So we found the particular combination that gives us that third vector, which means that that third vector is in the span of the first two. All right, that vector is in the span of the first two. Thus, span of just these two vectors, three, negative one, five, two, one, three, equals span of all three vectors. So what we just proved is you can take out that third vector and your span is still the same. Now the fact that we got one free variable means there was only one extra vector. So we just removed it. If you want to be super, super safe, you can check and make sure the two are independent. But when there's two vectors, if as long as they're not multiples of each other, they're independent. So as long as you can't make one vector by scalar multiplication of the other, your two vectors are independent. All right, so we got our set sp uh, spans the span, and it's independent. That's all it takes to make a basis. So we got a basis here. Well, I should say it's not the basis, it's a basis. It's just the set of vectors three, negative one, five, Two, one, three. So that is the basis we found, and we're done with this problem. So any other basis, you just multiply it by any integer, and you can have another basis? So I use this word, a basis, because there is infinite bases for spaces. I could have very easily, I made a choice up here, so the line at the bottom of the board, I could have solved for any of the three vectors. It's not hard to solve for the first vector. All you do is subtract the other two to the other side and then multiply by negative one half. I could very easily solve for the first vector, which means uh, if you can solve for the first vector, then I could have thrown out the three one five vector and kept the other two. So that would, the other two would be a basis. Likewise, I could have solved for the middle vector Subtract the other two, multiply by a third at the end, and now I solve for this vector. So I could choose the other two vectors for my basis. What that means, there's infinite correct answers for your basis. You can take your basis and multiply individually all the elements. So we, we chose this as our basis. I could have multiplied each of these by any non-zero scalar, and I still have a basis. So again, you can't use zero because zero is automatically not independent if you've got a zero vector. But I could scale these as much as I want. So I could put any alpha beta that's not zero and I still have a basis right here. So there are infinite numbers of bases. There is one really nice basis, uh, but and that basis is for n dimensional space, but you have to be careful because right here, we have a basis with two elements in it what is the dimension of our subspace? Too much thinking. The dimensions of our subspace, so it's in R3, but our dimension of our subspace is two. So we're, our subspace is a plane in three-dimensional space. So any two vectors that live on that plane that are linearly independent could be a basis. Now you want to be careful. I'll do my best to draw three-dimensional space on the board. So there's three-dimensional space. Now I'll try to draw a plane through the origin. Let's make it easy and pretend it's just a flat plane with no, no z equals zero. 
you have to be careful because if I take if I just grab any vector if it sticks out of the plane it's not a valid vector for the basis so your vector has to live inside your subspace so I can grab any two any two linearly independent vectors that live in the subspace so I can grab those two for example as long as their z-coordinate would be zero in this case so any vectors that live in your subspace are potential elements in your basis and as long as you pick the right number and they're independent you have a basis So this problem, we basically got rid of elements to make it independent. There'll be other times where your subspace is described in a different way, not as a span. And then you have to decide how many dimensions does your space have? And then how are you gonna go about picking basis vectors from that? Uh, there is a process to um, do this in a nice way. It's a little bit tricky if you don't see it as a span as to how to go about picking uh, basis vectors. So let's, let's pick a bad basis vector for this, uh, for this span. So there's two vectors in here. Right away, you should be able to tell there's, I can't even make the first vector with a linear combination of these. I can't get a Z coordinate that's not zero. So it's already bad right there. Uh, it is independent, but I can't even make the first vector in there, Never mind linear combinations of those two vectors. So you have to be careful. If you're just trying to construct a basis by hand, it's a little bit more tricky than just kind of guessing and checking. So this would fail miserably. And it's not that obvious if, if you didn't see what the basis was, or what the span was to start making a basis up. Uh, the, the process will generally go, you're basically going to start with the first vector and then very carefully do some operations to get your second basis vector. And it's not obvious how you do it. So we'll do that a little bit later. But you should be able to answer questions like, is this a basis? Is this not a basis? But constructing one is a bit more tricky.